Okay, so we 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 ended with the uh, crypt test and uh, okay, so there's one component that I need to do with you before we come to electrical properties. Just give me a minute. Let me just find the slide and I share with you. <laughs> okay, so I found the destructive tests uh, screen. I hope you're able to see it. It says content destructive test. Can I have a confirmation from one person that they're able to see the words destructive tests? Yes, yes madam. madam. Okay, all right. How was the first day of residential? We missed your presence. We were waiting for you, madam. You're waiting for me. I think there was a slight misunderstanding, I think, with the timetable. But it's been sorted out but I won't be able to meet you physically. So we'll have to continue with online lectures. But the test on Friday will be physical and it will be during your, during, is it 12 to 10 to 12 or 12 to 14? The time that shows on your timetable for BSP 170, that's the time that you're going to have the test. Madam, if you are not around, what can we just write the test also online? I don't, I'm not on Google Classroom or anything, so I don't have the credentials, so I cannot do it, unfortunately. So it has to be, and why, and why? We, I thought physical was better. If you are not around, but... <laughs> I know, unfortunately, I do not have the credentials on Google Classroom yet, so I cannot do an online test. So it will have to be physical because on what platform am I going to do an online test with you? I don't have the platform at the moment. I don't have the credentials to that platform yet. Okay, so the test that we looked at uh, uh, last time we met were are known as destructive tests, okay? Because in these tests, you're actually tempering with a specimen. Okay, so you get the material and you, from that material that you want, you intend to use, okay, in industry or for whatever project that you have, you get a specimen of that material, okay, prepare it according to standard and then test it in the required or the appropriate uh, machines for you to get the, the required results or the required test, whether it's a hardness test, whether it's a tensile test, impact test, whichever test you so wish to do. Okay, there are standards there uh, on how to prepare the pieces and those pieces are destroyed in the process. With tensile strength, it will be stretched till it breaks, isn't it? Impact, you'll be cutting across. So in all these tests, you're actually breaking the piece. 
So the question comes in is what if you want, you suspect that uh, uh, the integrity of a certain piece of uh, a spare part, sorry, let's say it's an aircraft. If there's a certain part or spare part that you suspect to have, uh, whose integrity you suspect to have been compromised, let it maybe be its strength or hardness, and you need to know, okay, you need to know as it stands, like how far, or if you suspect that it could have some, some cracks somewhere that you may not be able to see with your naked eye, and so on. So for such tests, they are what are known as non-destructive tests, okay, because those would probably be expensive spare parts, so you're not going to bring them on the machine and have them destroyed just like that. But you can actually uh, prepare them. I mean, you can actually test, okay, you can uh, test for some of these properties right on site without even having to um, remove, sometimes in some cases, remove that particular spare part from, from the machine, from the aircraft, or from the, from the vehicle. Okay, so for that, we use what are known as non-destructive tests. My laptop appears a bit slow today. Okay, so this is just, I'll just run you through this. Remind me to share this particular document with you after the lecture, I think it will help you. And this is where the notes for the non-destructive tests are. So, yeah, so this is just a, maybe just a short revision of what we did last time. Remember for our curves, so we have the force on the y-axis and extension on the x-axis. So like I was this, oh, like I was saying, for elastic material, for you know some elastic materials, they have no yield point. Okay, an example is cast iron. So what happens? Right there and then it breaks, isn't it? What does that say? It's not tough. Number two, it does not have the 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 the, the plastic region, so it does not deform plastically. Okay, there's no plastic deformation, that's for A. B, for this B curve here, what does this mean? An elastic material, what makes it elastic? It's the, the straight line, okay, the elastic region. So the fact that it has a definite elastic region, it means that it's very elastic. So the higher or the longer the straight line, the more elastic the material. The shorter the straight line, the less elastic or the more brittle the material. So for B, so B is somewhere in the middle, what does B tell us? Just by looking at the curve, we know that it's an elastic material with limited plastic deformation. An example is steel. So as you can see, it does have a plastic uh, region. However, it's short, okay? So this also tells us something about the toughness in comparison to C. So what kind of material is C? It's got a short straight line, okay? So the elastic region is quite short. So that tells us already that it's not very elastic. Okay, however, the curve, it's very long. The plastic deformation is very long. So it's able to endure, okay, a lot of stress without breaking. It really takes a long time, okay, before it finally breaks. So it will stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch. Remember, this is extension in millimeters. So it will even go this far without breaking, only up to this point will it break. So C is a material with a large plastic deformation. An example is copper. Okay, so copper is tough. So like we say, the region, are, the area below the plastic region or the curve, okay, the larger this region, the more or the tougher the material is. It also tells us something about uh, its properties. Okay, so this is uh, uh, depicting an extension graph for a ductile material. Okay, so uh, uh, you have the naking point, the breaking point. So we looked at this. This is known as the limit of proportionality. This is the elastic range, and this is the plastic range. 
Okay, so stress, stress. So this is you. This was this document will be good for you to actually revise what we looked at last week. There's been an example here that you can go through. When has it's a worked example? Okay, same as this one here. It's also a worked example. Ductility. We looked at this area reduction, percent reduction. So we looked at all this. We looked at proof stress. And how we draw a proportional line to where it meets the curve there, then you draw a line there to give you the force at two. Okay. And there's an example there, okay, of, um, so you'll be given these figures, okay, are given these values of extension and force. Force is always the y axis, extension is always the x. So from these values, you are asked to determine the UTS, the Young's modulus of elasticity, 0 0.1 proof stress, the percent elongation and percent reduction. So obviously you begin by first plotting the graph. Okay, so you have your force there and your extension. So uh, 0 0.1 extension somewhere there, right? Against 23, 23 must be somewhere there. Okay, and, you, and so on and so forth. So you keep plotting. So this becomes your UTS, force at UTS there. Okay, that's your proof stress there. You have 0 0.1 proof stress where it hits the curve and where it, uh, so you get the value there on the Y axis. That's your force at, at proof. So you have a worked example here that you can easily follow through. I don't know if you need, if you, if you want us to do it, to follow through together or you can do it by yourself. I think it's pretty much clear. And it's very similar to the one we did, I think 201. I think we actually did this or something very similar. Something quite, we did something quite similar to this. Uh, this, this means, yeah. Okay, so you, you're comfortable doing it yourself, huh? I move forward. Okay, so there's some more self-assessment here that you can actually go through. Question. Please mute our mics. Okay, so the ISO tests here, yeah, also the CHAPI tests and everything. You'll be able to do that. And the Bruno test is here also. So we looked at all this last week. I'm, I'm, I'm going through again because this is going to be in the tests. For whatever reason, my laptop actually is quite slow today. Let me see if I can close the 10 programs. Okay, just hold on a bit, please. It seems uh, my document isn't responding so well. It's non-responsive at the moment. Let me just try closing it and opening it again. Maybe that will help. Do we have someone taking the register? Can I? Can I please have someone uh, just note down the register for us? Is it Fides? Fides, I think is almost been called. Fides, please try and do it. I don't know if it's a screenshot or whatever you're going to do, just to make sure that we have uh, the register.
Okay, so when it comes to non destructive testing, so there are three types, actually, four types that we're going to look at. So the first one is dye penetrant. Okay, so this is a test that we use to find cracks in the surface of a component. So, for example, if you're taking for uh, these fatigue cracks in aircraft parts, before they spread and cause failure, of course, you know that if you're if you're flying in a, if you're flying a plane, oh yeah, you so you you do not need you cannot afford to have any kind of failure happening to your machine parts, isn't it? That could lead to a, a fatal accident. So, if you see certain cracks, you notice certain cracks, and you're not sure how deep they go. You can actually use this test, which is known as a dye penetrance, just to make sure or just to help you understand how the impact of those cracks or the impact of uh, those uh, fatigue cracks. So what you do is that you spray the component with a solvent cleaner just to remove the grease. So you start by cleaning it up with a solvent cleaner just to remove the grease. The next thing is that you spray it with a colored dye. So you usually use red dye for that. And this dye will penetrate into the cracks. Then when that dye dries up, you spray it with a developer, okay? So a developer that we use usually is just- Madam, you can't see the screen. Out. Excuse me, madam. Am I the only one who can see the screen? Oh, really? Even me, I can't. Okay, let me try and reshare. Okay, are you able to see it now? Yes, madam. All right, so after the, the dye is dried up, we use white talc powder to spray it across that same area where we have the dye. Then the dye in the cracks is drawn into the developer and shows up brightly. So the dye may be fluorescent or an ultraviolet lamp is needed to see them. Okay, so from there we'll be able to tell, okay, just depending on the impact of the color, we're able to tell how deep those cracks go. How deep those fatigue cracks uh, go? So there's an example here of uh, what is used. Okay, a gear. This is an example of a gear with uh, with cracks, as you can see there. Then the, the the talc powder was put on it, and then it was acting as a developer. And then uh, the places there where we had the cracks, the dye from inside showed up bright color. Okay. The next one is magnetic powder. So with magnetic, so for this question, for whatever reason, I always test my students. Can I please have your mics muted? So I always test my students on this question. This one every year, my favorite, but every year I get funny answers. Maybe that's why I always test students for this question. For whatever reason, I always get funny answers. I don't know why. Maybe it's exam fever. When it comes to the exam, people just panic and they just start now just dreaming up funny things. So magnetic powder. Okay, we do not use magnetic powder to test whether a metal is magnetic or not, no. Okay, so this is used for parts from ferrous material. So a strong magnetic field is passed through the component around any crack. Okay, so around any crack, the magnetic field will be concentrated. So you have that magnetic ion dust being concentrated in areas where there are cracks. So you generally spread it on a part, in a machine part. Okay. And then you pass a strong magnetic field through the components. And then in the areas where there's a crack, you find that uh, those, the magnetic dust will be more attracted to those areas. So where you have more gatherings of the dust, just know that there should be some cracks in that area. And then the magnetic uh, powder is later dusted in a dry form. Okay, and the test also can be carried out in a tank full of liquid with dust suspended in it, it still works that way. Okay, that is what that is what pretends magnetic powder. Coming to ultrasound also here, I always get funny answers about the hospital. And what not, pregnancies, no. We're dealing with material science. So please uh, resist the temptation. I know here it gives the, in the intro, in the note, it will give you that example, but that's not what we're looking for. Here, where our main concentration is uh, ultrasound pertaining to metals in particular, materials and metals in particular. So we know what ultrasound is. 
Okay, it's used in hospitals, even uh, for pregnancies in antenatal. Uh, ultrasound is used, okay, to produce those images of unborn babies and whatnot. But it's also used in material science. So high frequency sound waves are transmitted into a material to detect imperfections or to locate changes in material and material properties. So we use this just like they would use it in a hospital. Yes, it's also used on, uh, on materials. So sound, uh, sound is introduced into a test object and reflections or echoes from internal imperfections of the parts geometrical surfaces are retained to a receiver. Okay, that's basically how it works. There's an acoustic barrier here, the transmitter receiver, and this is how it basically looks like. So you have that transmission of wave happening there. Radiography also here involves the use of uh, penetrating gamma or X radiation. So for this one, usually students will talk about bones or tell me about how bones and how they test, but they'll talk about TB. Despite us looking at it in the context of uh, in the context of material science, so please resist the temptation to look at it from that angle. There's also this angle here that we are learning that we look at, that we look at these things from. So we use uh, gamma or X uh, radiation to examine materials and the, the defects in them or in their internal features. So an X-ray machine or radioactive isotope is used as a source of radiation. And this radiation is directed through a part or onto a film or other media. And the resulting shadow graph shows the internal features and soundness of that part. Material thickness and density changes are indicated as lighter or darker areas. So sometimes you find that when uh, a, ma a machine part was being produced in the factory, it underwent some, there's some defects that went unnoticed. Okay, so sometimes you find the machine part may be lighter than usual or in certain places it may be lighter than usual. Why? Because maybe there was a bubble that formed, okay, during hardening and uh, it has a, a hollow space in, in it. And that could actually seriously influence uh, the properties of that machine depending on how it's been used. So the radiography is one of those ways for us to determine, okay, to determine how big that hollow is, for example and whatnot. So the dark areas in the radiograph represent internal voids of the component. So where you see, so when you do an x-ray on that component, where you see dark regions, that's where you see the internal voids of the component. Okay, so this, this method is widely used for checking welds and pipes. So you should be able to at least have, give an example or two on these different types of, uh, on the applications of uh, these, uh, the different types of test methods. So for radiography, it's widely used for checking welds in pipe. Okay, so I think we'll end here for now. The rest are just uh, self-assessment tests that you can go through on your own. Okay, so let's continue with electricity. So I'm going to I'm going to close this document and then get back to uh, our notes on the electrical and magnetic properties. So here again, we'll not look at magnetic properties. Okay, we're just going to cover electrical properties. That should be enough to do it. Magnetic properties are a whole huge, huge topic that I feel is not at this point very necessary. So electricity, we all know what electricity is. We're actually using electricity in a way or another for us to conduct this, uh, this particular lecture. So it's a property uh, that is very important. And uh, electricity itself uh, is really the power line, okay, of our modern civilization. We cannot do without electricity. And uh, time and again, we have looked for other sources. There are so many sources of electricity, but uh, now we're all moving towards a cleaner, greener environment. And now we're now talking about um, uh, greener sources, okay, of electricity. We're talking about uh, solar. We're talking about um, uh, biofuels now, and so on and so forth. So um, that is just about it briefly on how we're trying to make uh, our electricity generation greener and greener and greener. So 
in that context, what do we mean by con elect uh, conduction of electricity? When we say that an electrical, or oh, uh, sorry, when you talk about uh, a material being a good conductor of electricity, briefly, what do we mean? Eric Mwende, what do we mean? Conduction of electricity simply means that it's the, it's the transfer of, of electricity from one point to another. Okay. Or transfer the, of electricity from one point to another, isn't it? Okay. So basically, how does that electricity move? So what 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 aids that transfer? What makes that transfer possible? How exactly does it happen? Is so the yes, Through movement of electrical ions, electron ions. Electrons and ions. Huh? Either electrons or ions, isn't it? So ionic movement or movement of electrons. Yes, that's just about how it happens. So when you hear that someone has been electrocuted, what, how do you think that happens? Have we ever heard of someone being electrocuted? Or yourself, maybe you've been electrocuted. You may have not died, obviously, but uh, you were probably electrocuted somehow. What do you think exactly happened? Is anyone to Yes. It means that um, um, the, the board becomes a conductor of the, the same ions and the, the electron. Mm. And the movement from, from, from the, the, the wires, it passes now through the human being. So your electro, the electrons moved from where? It, it, they move from, An from open. The, 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 uh -huh. from from the let's say from the wires. Mm. Then the human being becomes also a conductor and passes through the board. So the electrons left you. the wires and they entered you. I think the board becomes a conductor, madam. Yes, but how? Okay, let's let's okay, let's let me bring it down a bit. Uh, have you ever used the stove? Yeah, just stove like dancer. So when you, you when you try to get something from the stove, isn't it? You feel that ka effect. Uh, how do you explain it? Is it still your body being a conductor? But why is it that when I you think... put on why, why is it when you put on shoes, you don't feel that effect sometimes? It means that Maybe your body down. has become. Hello. Yes. Yes. I wanted to say that it's uh -huh. either your body has become is it negative or positive, so that the the positive and the negative start they, they attract each other. They need that's why the, the, the electricity passes through your body. Okay. Any other thoughts? Is it Chile show Eric? Yeah. Um, uh huh. Maybe like. Uh, for instance, sometimes there is a thing. So if there's no a thing, you find that it can be like for the stove. Mm. We we bond. You have to bond them. So if you put on shoes, uh, that uh, that bonding is uh, it's going to be protected. You can't be electrocuted. So okay. if there's no that a thing, you become electrocuted. So what's the purpose of a thing in that context? So what can we conclude as the purpose of a thing? The, madam, the purpose of earthing is mm. to direct the electrostatic charges into the earth so that it does not cause the, the shock or indeed electrocute someone. Okay. 
So at that moment when someone, okay, let's say someone, what would kill someone in an electric shock? What do you think kills someone? Obviously, it's the ions not down because they are uh, oh, that are It's the positive charge that is uh, going to cause the shock and uh, responsible for the electrocuting someone. But now, how like how does that shock happen? Is it like the heart? You know, like the body has organs. So now, which organ do you think is being attacked in this case? It's the heart, madam. Okay, so what happens to the heart? So there's sometimes when someone gets electrocuted, they don't die, and then sometimes they die. What's the difference? Okay, same, same voltage. Let's not, okay, I know you may say that maybe the other one, the voltage was low and whatnot. But let's say same voltage. Sometimes people will die, sometimes they don't. Okay, research on that one. I'll not give you the answer, but I think uh, it's enough to provoke your thoughts, isn't it? So of course, certain parts of electricity will not cover uh, because uh, it's, it's a wide, wide topic. So this is just meant to build on your past knowledge on electricity. Okay, that's the understanding for this. But anyway, conduction of electricity through a material, we already said it's a transfer of electrical charge from one position to another. Okay, what else is worth noting here? Charges may be transferred by movement of electrons or by migration of ions. Isn't it? So there's ionic movement and the electron movement. So from metals, why are metals good conductors of electricity? Because they already have that sea of electrons. They have already free moving electrons, okay? Just roaming in a sea, they actually come together and form what is known as a sea of electrons. Okay, such that if there's a charge now, if that particular metal is now put in the circuit, those uh, electrons are already free to move or to transfer that charge from one point to another. So that is what makes metals generally good conductors of electricity. The movement of ions is responsible for conductivity of electrolytes and for low conductivity is observed in insulating uh, materials. So the opposite of a good conductor is what? A bad conductor or what? Or, or what? Or an insulator, isn't it? So insulators are poor conductors of electricity. So there's what is known as Ohm's law, which we all know, I think. So Ohm's law relates to the current or time rate of charge passage to the applied voltage. So V is equal to IR. And um, uh, there's also what is known as electrical resistivity. From the context already, we can tell what it is. What is electrical resistivity? What do you think it is? So V is equal to what? And what is I? What V is the voltage? What about I? Current, isn't it? And resistivity there. So how do we come here? Let me just uh, try and share with you the relationship there that we have now between Ohm's law and the resistivity equation. Okay, so Ohm's law states what? V is equal to IR, isn't it? And then resist resistivity is equal to 